Indigenous Guyanese cannot be less equal than any other citizen of this country. They must have the same access to social services such as health, education and security. Their communities must benefit from the same quality of infrastructural development as all other Guyanese. Indigenous Guyanese must have equitable access to the resources of the state and are equal heirs to our natural patrimony. These are the fundamental principles under which the current administration is working with Guyana's First Peoples to develop and implement policies to ensure indigenous rights and an improved quality of life of their communities. It is not an easy journey ahead, but government and indigenous leaders have recommitted to working together as we will hear this week on Government in Action. President David Granger has renewed his government's commitment to sitting with indigenous leaders to craft a common agenda which seeks to develop both the hinterland and coastland at the same pace. During his presentation at the opening ceremony of the National Tushals Conference on August 21, the head of state cited the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a guide to the state in addressing the issues in these once overlooked communities. The Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, therefore, would be a meaningless scrap of paper if the state did not take account of the quality of life within the indigenous community where our people live. The state must aim at improving the situation of indigenous people as members of their communities, as citizens of this country. The National Tushaus Council, under the Dominion Act, is responsible for promoting good governance, and I'm glad to see that the words are part of the ambitious motto of this conference. The NTC is responsible for the preparation of plans and for improving the quality of life of the indigenous people and their communities. The council must do so. The council must try continuously to improve the social and economic conditions of their people and their communities. In an effort to solve the real problems in these communities on August 28, 2015, at its first presentation to the National Tushaus Conference, the President proposed a 10-point plan of action for hinterland development. This plan aimed at ensuring that indigenous communities become thriving economic units, the eradication of extreme poverty, reducing unemployment and increasing prosperity. The first aspect of this program involved the Hinterland Education Support Program, HESP, where the government pledged to ensure progressively over the next five years that every single primary school child is transported to school by boat, bicycle or bus, and every child having a nutritious breakfast when he or she arrives at school. Uniforms are also provided to these children and scholarships offered to those entering secondary school. This year, the President restated not only his commitment to ensuring equal access to education for all Guyanese, but described it as the gateway to improving the livelihood of the indigenous peoples and their communities. The government of Guyana, through the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, and together with the National Tushaus Council, have an obligation to work together towards improvement in the economic and the social conditions of indigenous people in several ways. First of all, as the Vice President correctly said, is in education. We must work together to improve the standard of education in terms of the three A's, access, attendance, and achievement, especially in the primary and secondary schools in our hinterland communities. Indigenous communities must not be left behind. In 2016, over 133,000 students benefited from the issuing of school uniform vouchers and the distribution of footwear and bicycles, particularly in the hinterland and riverine communities. The expansion of the hot meal program in 50 other nursery and primary schools in regions 1, 7, 8, 9 and the Pomeroon River benefited some 4,000 students and these figures continue to grow as the program expands to other remote areas. The President's 5Bs program, boats, bicycles, buses, plus breakfast and books, also supplements the HESP in many of the hinterland and indigenous communities.
This administration has made it clear that it will not promote a culture of handouts. Instead, it has committed to providing young people with the skills to make them employable. In keeping with this commitment, the Hinterland Employment and Youth Service, Hayes, was launched with the intention of providing sustainable jobs for young people and has begun to bear fruit. Communities in the Rupununi, Pataro Sipuruni, and Burima Waini are embarking on agro-processing and adding value to their natural resources and farm produce. The president urged that small and medium-scale industries within communities be promoted in an effort to provide work and generate wealth for our women and youth. Minister within the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Ms. Valerie Garida Lowe, speaking at this year's National Tushaus Conference, said that the first cycle of Hayes concluded with 1,800 youths completing the program and another 400 to benefit. Let me tell you that the majority of them turned out to be very smart, young entrepreneurs. We have discovered that their parents stood beside them, encouraged them to work with them so that they can establish a tribe and business. To the parents who did their duty, I say thank you. To the two shells and counselors who worked with the youth and provided spaces for them to operate their businesses, I thank you. The Ministry of Inclusion, people thank you. And our government, thank you. The second cycle has now commenced in a hundred villages and communities. And from reports coming into our ministry from no other than the VP himself and regional officials, there is excitement in the air. The 10-point plan also includes the Hinterland Poverty Reduction Program, and President Granger has reiterated during his many visits to hinterland and indigenous communities the importance of cultivating the vast and fertile lands and value-added production to the advancement of these communities and peoples. Speaking at the commissioning of the Paramakatoi Tomato Project Facility, Patara Sipuruni Region 8, on July 8, 2017, the president said that his government wants to ensure that all Guyanese have access to affordable food and highlighted the benefits of self-sufficiency. When we speak about food security, we speak most of all about making food available to everyone in sufficient quantities. We, make, we talk about making food available to everyone with a certain quality that you can live an active life. We talk about making food available in affordable quantities so that everybody, every child in Guyana could have access to food, could have enough food, and could have cheap food. And that is my concern about this great region, the Patara Sipuruni region, that it could very well be the food bowl of this country. At that event, the head of state restated his government's vision of ensuring that the quality of life and the standard of living in the hinterland is the same as it is on the coastland, and that Guyanese, wherever they are, enjoy a similar standard of living and a similar quality of life. In addition, the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, in collaboration with the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, has completed a study of indigenous women and children that would guide the ministries and organizations in formulating better programs together with the indigenous people. Land is life for the indigenous peoples and the government of Guyana in its 10-point plan pledged the establishment of the Hinterland and Indigenous Peoples Land Commission. On March 10, 2017, the Land Rights Commission was established and has been the subject of some controversy as it relates to those lands in Indigenous communities. Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs Mr. Sidney Alicock acknowledged that within the Indigenous communities, there are lingering doubts about land issues, fueled by ugly rumors that government will take away these lands, among other concerns. He reassured that this is not the case. The NTC executives were challenged to examine their own stewardship and work in the remaining months of the term to ensure that the legacy they leave will be celebrated by future generations. Even as I express my sincere faith in our leadership at the level of the village and communities, I pause to again comment on the leadership of the level of the NTC, the NTC executive. I detect the need for a stronger, more unified approach to decision making at the level of the executive. I urge that we recognize the need for deepening the process 
of consultation on some critical issues between that body and the wider leadership of the NTC, which means you. Have you been consulted on these things? Do you know what is happening when the 20 executive members make a decision? Do you, are you partaking in it? We would like to know so that if it is well, then we, we elaborate. If it's not, let us find a way of how we could be able to make it stronger. In spite of these and other concerns, Chairman of the NTC, Mr. Joel Fredericks, expressed gratitude to the government for giving the Council the leverage to operate freely and to make decisions in the interests of the Indigenous peoples. Under the People's Progressive Party, PPP, the NTC said that every component of the conference was managed by the PPP, while the independent media and other organizations were banned from attending. Even as the chairman acknowledged that all the issues raised by the village leaders, which range from limited financial assistance, transportation woes, limited meetings of the NTC at the village level, environmental issues caused by mining, health concerns and more, cannot be solved immediately, he committed to working with the government to secure the rights of the indigenous peoples. And that is what we want, Mr. President. Let us talk about issues. It is only leaders who are strong and brave can bring real issues that affect people and find solutions to them. Some leaders are afraid to talk about it. But the NTC and the vice is not afraid. We will bring the issues to you and we have to stretch our brains and minds and ideas to fix. We may not fix all, but for this time, we must work together to fix the issues. The Tushaws participating in this year's conference were very vocal about the issues affecting their communities and how government and the relevant agencies have been addressing same. At Tushaw, Mr. Ernest Thompson said much more needs to be done and more discussions are needed with the government to address the infrastructural deficiencies in the hinterland communities. A road is the main one, main because we live hundreds of miles from Bletham and uh, the road is really uh, serious, need a lot of repairs, bridges, need uh, upgrading of uh, the whole road system so that we can bring out our uh, things from market to Letham and even to Georgetown. To show Mr. Patrick Gomes of Upper Tack to Upper Essequibo, Region 9, while acknowledging that the NTC is made up of Executives of various political affiliation expressed hope that those views will not interfere with the effective functioning of the body. Yes, things have improved. Things have improved over the years. And I hope it, will, it can become a very strong organization if the leaders are really um, have commitment to their people. The leaders call too for the involvement of the indigenous community in the process of constitutional reform, as Tushau of Shulinab, Nicholas Fredericks, pointed out. We as indigenous people can contribute towards the, 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 the whole development of these constitutions and, and bylaws and stuff like that. It would put us in a better position in this country to make proper representation of our indigenous people's rights. President Granger made a strong call to the Council to capitalize on the opportunities of the Forum to exchange ideas with a view to enhancing governance and advancing the development of the indigenous peoples. That the National Tushaus Conference is not a talk shop, it's a workshop. It's a forum for planning, it's a forum for problem solving, it's a platform for performance, it's a means to strengthen the administration to advance the social and economic development of villages and to provide good governance throughout our country. I therefore urge the Council to adopt the administrative measures needed to improve the quality of life of our communities. Meanwhile, Minister Ali Kok expressed confidence that with government support and the input of village leaders, the indigenous communities will be properly positioned for continued development. Government through your ministry has worked in partnership with the indigenous community of Guyana with tremendous success. The Amerindian Development Fund, the ADF, with its community development projects, the CDPs, has and continues to impact positively on the sustainable livelihoods of our indigenous peoples all across Guyana. 
It is continuing to address economic development, capacity building, and the growth of village economy, among other things. The allocation of this plot of land for the construction of the NTC Secretariat was deemed as a step in the right direction by the NTC and is testimony to the government's commitment to working with and strengthening the performance of the Council. President Granger, Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu, Minister Alicock and Mr. Fredericks turned the sod at this location here in Sofia on Monday, August 21 for the construction of the Secretariat. The NTC believes the establishment of the Secretariat and the hiring of permanent staff will ensure that incoming executives are properly briefed on the policies and programs and that these will be properly documented. This has been Government in Action. Join us again next week for another episode. I am Stacey Carmichael saying goodbye. <music>